Hi, I'm Jacob Heilbrem, the editor of The National Interest, and my guest today is Graham Allison, who directs the Belfer Center at Harvard University and has a long and distinguished career both in government and in academia. Graham, you wrote a famous book on the Cuban Missile Crisis. You've also talked about World War I in relationship to the Ukraine. Can you tell us what do both crises have to teach us today? Oh, a good question. So I think particularly now that we're living right in the window of the events that were the run-up to World War I just a hundred years ago, it's worth going back and revisiting that. And uh, here on the 28th of June, an archduke who was the successor to the Austro-Hungarian throne was um, murdered by a terrorist group. Uh, there then was a lull uh, after that. There was an ultimatum from Austria-Hungary to Serbia to punish them. Uh, then there was a set of mobilizations and one thing led to the other and pretty soon you were in a, a war that was so devastating that historians had to invent a whole new category for it called World War. And so that's World War I, a war in which all of the parties lost. At the end of it, every one of the leaders who were making those decisions had lost the thing that he cared most about. So the Kaiser's gone, and so is his empire. The Austro-Hungarian Empire dissolved, and so with the emperor. The Tsar overthrown by the Bolsheviks. The French bled uh, for a generation. The British, uh, their economy and their, their society, basically. So here, th what that shows us is that as inconceivable as it was to the people who were making those choices, lo and behold, one thing led to the other, and a cat catastrophe happened. So I think for all of us to try to remember that mistakes uh, and miscalculations and failures to appreciate how uh, a complex set of interactions can actually produce a result that nobody would have chosen. If you done had a do-over, people say, oh, let me do play that hand again. All of them would have played an extremely different hand. And the missile crisis was a similar case in which a confrontation between the US and the Soviet Union, Kennedy and Khrushchev, had parties looking eyeball to eyeball, as it was said at the time. You end up finally finding a resolution, but after the crisis, Kennedy and Khrushchev, but especially Kennedy, was was trying to learn, he said, and teach the lessons of constraint that would produce an effect what he called the precarious rules of the status quo, in which never after that would the US or the Soviet Union challenge each other in its area of core or vital interests. And so they, again, the idea that during the Cold War, even though we had a deadly adversary, somebody who we really did believe was an evil empire, and it was, okay? There were still some constraints on the behavior in this competition, recognizing that if the effect of being more aggressive was to produce a war from which we were all killed, that wouldn't be victory. Graham, you talked earlier today about realists being an endangered species, and some of the language that you just used is very much out of the realist school, vital interests, mm -hmm. national interests. Can you tell me why are you a realist and why did you become a realist? It's interesting that Harvard, where you are, actually, mm -hmm. for all its reputation as a fairly liberal place, if you think about it, has produced a number of leading realists besides yourself, Sam Huntington, mm -hmm. Henry Kissinger. So what was it in your own background? that? Well, I, I had the good fortune to be a student of Henry Kissinger. I was his key course assistant. Uh, I've remained a good friend and colleague over, over the many, many years. Sam Huntington was another one of my teachers, then friends and colleagues. And I would say that, that generally, if you look at the world with fairly clear eyes, it's pretty hard not to start with Realism 101. I mean, just uh, and if you look at things from a historical point of view, another one of my mentors and teachers and friends was Ernest May, one of the great international historians. You simply cannot study history and not notice that countries have core interests, that their behavior with respect to core interests is much more active than with respect to other sets of interests, that they have hierarchies of interest. So I would say it's uh, common sense, yeah. 
Graham, one of the uh, interesting phenomena today is that uh, President Obama is being attacked by, uh, among other camps, neoconservatives. Uh, they say that he is a feckless appeaser in foreign policy. Can you share us your thoughts about both neoconservatism and your perception of how successful or unsuccessful Obama's foreign policy has been and will be in the future? Well, let me try to be brief on both. I would say first, in, especially in Washington today, everybody has concluded that the Obama foreign policy failed and that this has been a disaster. I think that's a bum rap. I think that the world is a very uh, disagreeable place, that lots of things have happened in the world that are not necessarily in the U.S. interests. But if I ask myself what would be worse than what Obama did in every instance, not a single instance, do I believe that the choice that Senator McCain, whom I know and like very much, would have been a better choice? or that the prescription of the neoconservatives would have been a better choice. Or the prescription of the liberal adventurists, as I call them, would have been a better choice. So it would have been a better, we would be better off if we had bombed Syria rather than working with the Russians and getting the, elim the chemical weapons eliminated? I don't think so. We would be better off if we uh, sent forces back into Iraq? I don't think so. We'd be better off if we uh, sent advisors and arms to Ukraine. I don't think so. So President Obama's mantra, which he did at uh, West Point, which is don't do stupid stuff, I would say you get half a prize for that. I, that's not the full prize, because, uh, but, it, but it certainly beats the hell out of doing stupid stuff of which we've had plenty of experience lately. So don't, doing, don't do stupid stuff, or as Hippocratic said, uh, you know, do no harm is a good place to start. That's not sufficient. And I would say the Obama administration has been unsuccessful in articulating a bigger picture of what we're trying to achieve in the world, as well as not falling in holes. But I would prefer strongly not to fall in holes. And if I look at the, the advocacy of the revival of the neoconservatives. And similarly, uh, because I'm a Democrat, okay, uh, the, what I call liberal, they call themselves liberal interventionists. I call them liberal adventurists. Okay? Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, if you look at, at uh, Anne-Marie Slaughter's recommendations, they look almost like neoconservative uh, views. And the proposition that if we just bomb Syria, then Putin would take notice and wouldn't behave the way he did in Ukraine, doesn't comport with anything I can see about international politics. You would think that, I mean, if you had malpractice as a, as a, a you know, if, if you had legal liability for malpractice, the neoconservatives who brought us to uh, devastatingly unsuccessful wars in Iraq and Afghanistan would be disqualified for, I think that mostly when you're, for, for malpractice, you have to suspend your license for 20 years or something. So I, I would vote for that. Yeah. Well, Graham, that's quite a rousing conclusion. Uh, anyone who's watching this may have noticed that I have a book on my, uh, in my lap, which is Graham's latest on Lee Kuan Yew, another prime realist thinker, which I encourage you to consult. Thank you, Graham, for the interview. Thank you for having me.